stayed active in the church long after my confirmation, right up until I went to college. Why did you decide to walk away? It didn't make sense to me. And growing up, we prayed. This is a miracle of itself, just right there. By itself alone, a fungus that grows on the roots of trees. What they discovered many years ago, actually now, was that this fungus and the network it creates between trees. I went up to the altar in front of the cross. And I remember breaking down in tears, essentially asking and for the 360 joints in your body. Right. At one breath. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. We're here in Irving, Texas, y'all. And I'm with a Texan, I believe he is. <laughs> and he also has a wonderful story from a, a music producer, went on a faith journey of eight years, was in the United Methodist Church. His mother was in the church. And his whole journey is very, very captivating, interesting, least to say. And then he became what we're going to be talking about today. And Imam, how do you do all this? When we come back and you hear this wonderful story with this wonderful brother. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Peace be upon him. This is our religion, Islam, Islam. This is the Deen Show. Girl, I love you very much. I love all the work that you're doing. When I was ready to talk about it, I would only talk to you. Yes, and I was explaining how much respect I have for the faith of Islam. Welcome to the Deen Show. The Deen Show. Assalamu alaikum, Imam Saeed. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you doing? Alhamdulillah, I'm doing great. Man. Nice to finally make this happen. We've had this in the works, works for years. Works for a long time, yeah, yeah, for sure. Alhamdulillah, now we finally got to put it together. So before we get to asking the million dollar question, how you ended up becoming an imam actually, mm. right? And for those people, can you explain to the people who are new to the term, what is an imam? Okay, so an imam is a term that's used to signify the religious leader of a Muslim congregation. Linguistically, it literally means someone who stands out front. And if you've ever witnessed a Muslim prayer, and if you haven't, we welcome you to come down to any mosque in your neighborhood to do just that. But a Muslim imam, the religious leader, when the prayer is taking place, the formal prayer, the imam stands in front of the congregation lined up in rows behind him to lead them in that prayer. Hence the term Imam, one who stands out front, used to mean a religious leader of the Muslim community. We're here with uh, Siraj from Daoud, so he'll law firm. Yes. Yeah. All right, guys, so we signed everything here. Bismillah. Now we're off to the next step. we got to get the keys now. بالحب اجتمعنا وربنا يحييكم بالحب اجتمعنا وربنا يحييكم مرحبا ويا هلا فيكم انتو منا واحنا فيكم بالمحبة نحييكم يا هلا ويا هلا يا هلا ويا هلا ويا هلا ويا هلا yeah, hello, yeah, hello, yeah. The amount of uh, Muslims around here, it's, it's pretty huge. And uh, like the, this, the, the place, the location that you opened in, basically it's far it's further south from the other, the other big masajid. And everyone, I know a lot of people that I, I used to, I come, my, my cousin lives nine minutes from here. Another uh, uncle my, of mine lives about five to ten minutes from here. This area, you know, the masjid, alhamdulillah, opened up in an area that it's much needed. And this size, you know, this, 
you know, the center, this center is much needed for this area and the idea of this center is needed for the whole state because we don't have anything like that in the whole state the da'wah center where it's gonna basically nurture and basically educate and it's gonna basically spread Islam so tell me now, your journey wasn't always one of a Muslim background, father and mother weren't Muslim, ones who, uh, and just for people hearing that term, Muslim, someone who submits his or her will to the creator of heavens and earth. Now tell me, your mother worked in the church, did your father also work in the church? So you grew up in the church if your mother worked in the church, right? Very much so, Tell us yeah. a little about those early beginnings. So as, as my dear brother was saying that um, I grew up in the United Methodist Church and not just as someone who identified as a United Methodist, but as he alluded to, my mother for most of my life worked for the United Methodist Church, the state offices. So we frequently on uh, days off from school, she was a single mother um, for most of our life. Our, our father and mother got divorced very early on. Um, so we would go with her to the office because she had no babysitting. So we would spend our time in the offices of the church. We would be interacting with church employees and pastors and different people like that all the time. And I still remember fondly uh, many times when she would come home from work in the ch state offices of the United Methodist Church. She would sometimes get into arguments with my grandmother because we lived with her for a time who was Lutheran and grew up Lutheran. And my mother grew up Lutheran but converted, if you will, the United Methodist when she married my father. And she would come home, barely be there long enough to have dinner or do anything, and we'd walk around the block to the, to the church behind our house, which was United Methodist Church that we attended, and we would spend a large portion of the night at the church after that. And that was an ongoing theme in our life, and I remained, as Eddie and I were talking about, in Christianity and the United Methodist Church and most Protestant churches, there's a process called confirmation, which is essentially graduating from Sunday school. Most of the time when someone graduates from Sunday school, you don't see them again until they're married or having children. Um, I, on the other hand, stayed active in the church long after my confirmation, right up until I went to college. And then once I returned from college, I was at the church again on a regular basis. Uh, at that point, um, I was far on into my faith journey, and it was more out of habit by that time than it was anything else. But before, that was the way I led my life. So for most people who are ignorant, when they hear these terms, um, the Methodist, Presbyterian, um, Evangelical, and all the other different names that uh, go alongside under the umbrella of Christianity, correct? Mm -hmm. What's the difference particularly with this denomination, this particular United Methodist they they actually at the time I first uh, w w was part of the church they were just Methodists but there was a change in the organization of the church they became United Methodists they had joined with other bodies from within the church itself ironically that same body that currently is known as the United Methodist Church is going through a fracture at this time where you are having the United Methodist Church and a growing group of Congregational Methodists who is breaking away from the United Methodist Church. The core issue being the growing, shall we say, openness of the United Methodist Church. They pride themselves as on throwing the doors open to anyone and everyone wherever they are in terms of their life journey, in terms of their identification, etc. They're very open and they've been growing in that for many, many years. So in the current trends, they are one of the more, shall we say, open, uh, permissive might not be the right word, but um, non-judgmental churches that are out there. And so the Congregationalists are starting to break away because they're looking for more of the quote-unquote traditional values of the older church. So as a Methodist priest, to be a Methodist priest, you can be uh, any, you know, there's certain guidelines in certain, like in Islam, you know, there's a certain guideline to being an imam, you know, and are those guidelines now pretty much just vague? Are they pretty much very flexible? And it's like, you know, anybody can be a, a priest or a, a pastor, Pastor is a title, right, for the right, Methodists? Right. Is it anybody? 
to to my knowledge, I don't know that much about the the process, but they do have an expectation of a certain level of education, experience, and things like that. Frequently, they'll have, for lack of a better term, like an internship yeah. with a community or something like that. But they do have a higher expectation in terms of. Uh, education and experience and things like that etc now strictly speaking of course in the islamic communities there's not a, a requirement so to speak of a formal education a community say in a small town or somewhere far flung they would pick the imam from amongst themselves and it would be the one they see as the the most righteous and the most qualified to lead so, and this is an important distinction sometimes we need to understand in islam the leader of a community isn't always necessarily going to be the most knowledgeable religiously or the one who knows the most Quran, although that is one of the criteria that we use to try and select. The leader of a community is chosen for their ability to fulfill the needs of the community. So sometimes someone, someone with maybe a deficient lack of uh, deficiency in knowledge compared to someone else may be chosen to lead because they have greater skills and acumen in terms of leadership or in terms of conflict resolution or things yeah. like that, etc. And if you've ever been in larger communities, conflict resolution, leadership, things like that are vitally, vitally important. Yeah. Let me ask specifically before we go on with more of your journey, so we're trying to understand because the reason I'm asking is because we see a lot of Christians getting fed up with people bending the rules and making mm -hmm. things up as you go. So we know in Islam, just to be a contract, for, out of God's wisdom, you know, God's love, you know, He has cer ordained certain things and they cannot be, you know, transgressed. Like, for instance, you can't, uh, unless you're in a state that you're going to die, drink alcohol, for instance, mm -hmm. or pork, for instance. Right. A man is not because now man is better than women or anything, right? But the man is the one who leads the prayer. Right for example, right. and you can't have someone who a man marries, not a man, a man marries a woman, mm -hmm. right? So now if you have someone like opposing this and that person is the imam, do right. you see this? A lot of people are, we're seeing this in many churches happening. Is this happening in Methodist churches also? Because you um, said they're open. So that's right, the they are open. I, I don't know with, with absolute certainty, but I know that there's been trends towards openly gay priests and pastors, there's been, you know, they, they definitely are more than willing to authorize and sanctify a, a union of uh, the same sex, male and male, female and female. They, they, they've opened their doors to that. And I don't know their arguments or their explanations of the, of the verses in the Bible that speak against that very clearly, but they, they have opened themselves to that. And again, that's something that some segments of the church are starting to rebel against and wanting to separate themselves so as to maintain some of those older values. It's an ongoing battle throughout many churches, as I'm sure Eddie has spoken about before. Um, churches in general around the country are suffering from a dwindling population, a graying population, the youth are abandoning religion en masse, and the churches themselves, even the, even the congregants of the older generations, are leaving the church progressively more and more and more. They're becoming dead institutions, and they're closing down, or as I've had experience with some of the pastors and, and the preachers in this area, in Irving, Texas alone, they're having to combine congregations. You'll find wow. Uh, Methodist Church, actually one of the Methodist pastors near here that I've had contact with many times, he shared with me that he had, I believe it was three different church services in his space. They were sharing space. It was the only way they could maintain. They couldn't, uh, uh, by themselves, his very great dwindling population, especially after the pandemic, of course. The pandemic ravaged every community, save the Muslims. The Muslims now have rebounded with a, a fierceness, but he couldn't support the building that they had historically used. He had to start bringing in other congregations that were renting out the space and using it for their services. Yeah. So two and three services, not like our church, our centers where we're having two and three services because it's so crowded, we need to have multiple services. In their case, they don't have enough people even for one service. They're renting it out for other people to have their services in order to be able to maintain and then, their building. And then combining it with uh, and other churches coming together mm -hmm. that could have probably conflicting views. Absolutely, right? so, absolutely. Oh, wow, so a lot yeah, of compromise so, is happening there, huh? Absolutely. Wow. So, yeah. And that's, um, this is something amazing. I mean, this is just for someone to really think and reflect. Where do you have, I was thinking about that. I was going to Fudger, 
prayer at the Valley Ranch Mas mm -hmm. Masjid. That's about, what, 10 minutes from here, 15 minutes from 10, here? 10, 15 minutes, yeah. And you've been there, obviously, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we're going to prayer, and I'm seeing all these cars, and I'm seeing it's full. It's like almost like <laughs> Juma yeah. and some mosque, yeah. unless it's mosque. And I was thinking, like, wow, this is so amazing. Where else do you see this, that before the sun right. has so risen, yeah. you have this many people coming to worship God Almighty, Allah? Yeah. Where do you see yeah. this? It's truly amazing yeah. and when you contrast it with people who are Absolutely. just Absolutely. I mean, it's hard for people to understand. Frequently when we have visitors here for open houses or I'm mentoring people or t talking to them about the religion because of their interest and their curiosity, we'll do tours of the building, we'll show them the prayer hall and the rest of the building. And when we talk to them about the prayer hall, they get to see it. I talk about some of the architectural stamp uh, features and what they were, were used for historically and what they're used for now versus everything else and then I talked to him about the room and how when we pray and that for the late the later prayers Maghrib and Isha the the sunset prayer and the last prayer of the night we have on average on average in the middle of the week we'll have 500 people 500 let me be more accurate 500 men I can't even begin to speak to how many women may be here so we're talking over 500 people coming to pray in in the evening time in the middle of the week Mm -hmm. And that's unheard of. Even in Dallas, that's an that's that's an anomaly, slight, slight anomaly, that you get that large of a congregation. That's one of the the blessings yeah. of this community is that we have such a huge uh, congregation of Muslim of those who are praying that are coming on a regular basis. And so even during Jumas, we have approximately three thousand people every Juma that come through here. You know, at a minimum, and then for Eids, of course, we aren't even going to speak about the Eids. And not even talk about that, there. huh? Yeah. So before we even get to where you're here, we're kind of dabbling into it a little bit. But for someone to think like, "Well, I got to look into it," because Islam, Islam is powerful. You know, mm -hmm. you know what I mean. To have you now come into it this way, and so many other continues to be the fastest growing way of life. You went on your journey. You explored, and before you made your decision, what are some of the other things? So you ended up being a part of the church. Mm -hmm. You had your what's called the confirmation. Why did you Why did you decide to walk away? I started having questions in my teenage years, as many children do in their teenage years. Many converts, um, if they don't actually convert in their teenage years, their journey oftentimes begins in those years, because uh, this is an age where children's minds are developing in such a way that they're questioning basically everything, especially their parents. And so I was beginning a faith journey at that time, having uh, not so much doubts, but just questions and, and confusions or, or curiosities about my faith and about how the faith uh, felt about certain things. Notably, the one thing that I can remember being able to verbalize was the question of when we're talking about others who they behave as we behave. In other words, they don't drink, they don't commit fornication, they don't worship idols, things like that. All things that as a Christian we looked at as, as righteous. We saw as it's something from the commandments themselves, but they just don't call themselves Christian. What do we think about them? How do we feel about them? And I, I started asking questions about this. I started with my mother because of you know, the, the respect I had for her because of the role I knew she had in, in the church and things like that, etc. And she was una unable to answer my question. And I started to explore other denominations of Protestant Christianity. Um, besides a brief stint with the Pentecostal church, one of the holy roller, um, holy spirit filled churches, um, I never really found any answers. Um, and I started to explore elsewhere. As Eddie and I had talked about earlier, um, I explored Taoism and Confucianism, which, strictly speaking, aren't religions in and of themselves. They're more philosophies from the Far East. When I was looking into them, I even looked into Native American spirituality for a time, the Lakota in particular, which was the common tribe in the, in the Midwest, and um, didn't find what I was looking for. And, and people sometimes question, how is it that you you reject what you're being told as not being the right answer. And I try to explain it to them. I tell them, I said, if you've ever put together a puzzle, you have part of the puzzle assembled and there's gaps in the puzzle itself, you may not know exactly what the piece you're looking for 
looks like, but you have an idea. You have a rough conception of the shape of it, of some of the colors, and so when you see it, you know. This was like the peace I was looking for in my spiritual journey. I didn't know what the answer was. I couldn't verbalize the exactness of what it was I was searching for, but I knew I would recognize it when I found it. And so eventually I did. But it took me six years before I started through the doorway of that path to start to explore it. And that path, that doorway was Islam. And the answer came in the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. In Surah Al-Baqarah, the second chapter of the Quran, the 62nd ayah where Allah says about those who have believed and those who are Jews and those who are Christians and those who are Sabians, all who believe in Allah on the last day and work righteous deeds, no fear shall be upon them, nor shall they grieve. And at that moment, it was like a lightning bolt. I had found my answer. The answer was there. And not just that, when you talk about sciences of the Quran, when Allah repeats something in the Quran, it's a way of emphasizing the lesson and the knowledge that he's sharing with you. And that same phrase is repeated at least once or twice more in the Quran. So that was a very valuable and an important lesson that Allah was teaching. Mm -hmm. And it resonated with me on a level that could, it was just unheard of. From that moment on, it was never a question of whether or not I was going to be Muslim. It was merely a question of when. Because that goes back to what you were saying earlier, you know, when we were talking off camera, how you're looking for that question, what about other people? You know, a lot of people say, what about the guy? He never heard about Islam. Mm -hmm. He's in a jungle somewhere, you know. He's here, he's there, he's everywhere. But if the person's truly worshiping God Almighty alone, he's just calling upon the Creator. Mm -hmm. That's the monotheism. That's what Islam is built on, a pure monotheism. Right. Right? So if someone didn't heard about heard about Islam, but he's not worshiping a stick, stone, a bone, you know, any he's he's not worshiping a dog, a cat, a, right. a, a messenger. He's worshiping God Almighty alone, right? right. And he's uh, committed to that. And and when you look at a lot of these different cultures and you go back and you look and you dig into their uh, whatever remnants of whatever, you know, there you'll find the roots. You, you'll find those roots yes. in monotheism, in pure monotheism, right? Absolutely. Yeah. So that's yeah. that's that's true, truly amazing. Uh, and there's uh, there's another individual. I walked into your office here. Can you hand me the the book here? So this is a phenomenon because this is another person I spent some some good time with. Uh, yes. He was a good friend of mine. Also, I've had him on a show. We did many many episodes together. He was, uh, had a doctorate, a master's, I believe, in, in uh, church divinity. Yeah. Yep. Uh, he was a theologian. He was in the, uh, the church. He was preaching, teaching Dr. Yeah. Gerald Dirks. Yeah. You met him also, right? I've met Mr. Dirks, may, may, our brother. May Allah have yeah. mercy on him. Amin, Amin. And uh, may Allah bless his wife. She's also Ameen. alive. Uh, Deborah Dirks, sister, yes. if you're there watching. Who, who, who's also written a book on the journey of many, many women in their conversion process, telling their story. So um, it didn't end with our brother Dirks. His wife has continued the, the journey of sharing the knowledge and the wisdom and the experiences of those that are going through this journey. And she has a wonderful book that contains the stories of many women's experiences of discovering Islam and yeah. the liberation they found in that journey. Yeah, and this is not, you know, these are not dumb people. These are wise people who are Absolutely. looking for the purpose of life, why they've been created, why they're here. They go on an exploration like you did, a faith journey of eight years. And, and I never want any of our Christian friends, neighbors think like, oh, they're picking on us or this because <laughs> when we talk about Trinity or we talk about because that's where you started. And those are the questions that people have. Right. Just like someone, you're in a university and the, the teacher is adding up two plus two is five. And then you're questioning that just right. like you probably in... Uh, what were your questions about Trinity, about the crucifixion mm -hmm. of Jesus? These are this is the this is the bedrock of Christianity. Just like someone can go and challenge the the pure monotheism, the Tawheed, what we call it, of Islam, mm -hmm. they can challenge these things in the preservation of the Quran, and we're more than happy to discuss. If a person's sincere, they're humble, they want to know. Right. So, what was your experience with this? the relationship of Jesus, him dying for your sins, him being one in three in the Trinity. Right, How did you right. battle and tackle with this? Honestly, it was never a battle for me. Um, there's one, one instance I remember from my, from my later years when I was still a, a practicing Christian. For those who aren't familiar, during Easter in the, in the Christian calendar, um, at least the United Methodist Church, in my understanding, as many churches have similar services, they have this service on the day that they believe that Jesus died. 
on the day of his crucifixion, and they'll have this very solemn ceremony in the church where there's a there's a pre you know there's a sermon and things, and then they'll shut out the lights, and all that's left in the sanctuary are candles. And the candles are lit, and you're allowed to stay there after everything finishes as long as you choose. And all they have is one light, at least this was in the church that I attended, one light on the cross in front of the, in front of the congregation. And you would sit there, and you would reflect, you would whatever. And this one year, in the midst of my faith journey, I was there, and I was the last person to leave the sanctuary because I was there... And I knew the other person, the last person to leave before me was a, a woman, a friend of my mother's, um, who I knew and we'd spent much time with, who was there for a long time. And I knew part of the reason was because one of her loved ones had died recently. Mm -hmm. So she was in a very emotional state. She stayed for quite a long time. I stayed as well. After she had left, I went up to the altar in front of the cross. And I remember breaking down in tears, essentially asking, and I think I even verbalized it this way, why? I didn't understand the why this needed to happen. It didn't make sense to me. And growing up, we prayed. Uh, you, you couldn't tell me otherwise. You couldn't convince me that prayer didn't work. But any time I prayed, I always prayed to God. I never prayed to Jesus. And many Christians, when you hear them pray, they say, you know, Lord Jesus, or may the Lord Jesus, etc. You know, you know, provide for us, etc. They have this, this. It's clear associationism in the way they verbalize the things that they say. But I never remember praying to Jesus. I always prayed to God. The God that Jesus prayed to. Exactly. And there's plenty of evidences, and there's plenty of examples in Jesus' own words in the New Testament to show that how he prayed was the same. So there's a whole other conversation yeah. that could happen around that, etc. But so you couldn't convince me otherwise. But I was having this moment. If there was ever a faith crisis for me in my journey, that was probably the moment where I, my mind and my heart at that point could no longer even fathom or even accept the, the, the idea, let alone the reality, that this per, this man had died for my sins and had and that this was a necessary thing and that this was a godly thing that this was something that you know the lord of hosts was was going to do it didn't make sense to me on a on a deeply spiritual personal level and so i completely just broke down in tears and just could not accept and comprehend and understand and that inevitably only propelled my journey forward because I had, I had whatever vestiges of attachment to that theology, to that what I had been taught in Sunday school and confirmed in, graduated in, broke every last tie that may have been there. And now I was free to roam unhindered and ask the questions that my heart had nurtured all that time and searched for the answers that alhamdulillah eventually they led me to a law uh, led me to his book and they led me to his deen subhanallah there's so many uh, evidences that people use the scientific miracles in the quran the prophecies the authenticity of the quran its preservation what were some of the key things finally that did it that had you take your shahada that first step that initiation that you declared there's nothing worthy worship except god almighty allah and Prophet muhammad just like mm -hmm. abraham Moses, Jesus, and all the preceding messenger, he was the final messenger right. sent for all of mankind as a mercy to the world. Right. What finally did it for you? Well, the ayah I had shared earlier was really kind of the catalyst. That was that was catalyst that kicked was, it off? That was, that, was, that was the one, like I had said, after reading that ayah, the, the 62nd ayah. How long in, after that did you did you take your shahada? Oh, it was probably at least six months. I don't Because I don't even remember when it yeah. was exactly. So finish your point, what you were saying. So the, the, the ayah itself, talking about the you know those who believe and those who are Jews yeah. and Christians and Sabians, all who believe in the law and work righteous deeds, no fear shall come upon them. Or their reward is with their Lord, no fear shall come upon them, nor shall they grieve. I needed to correct the, the, the way I translated that last time. Um... That answered the question, the, 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 the one key question that was brewing in my heart. And I didn't become Muslim right away by any means, um, but that pretty much closed the door behind me. There was no going back at that point. Yeah. It was now a question of 
just completing the forward journey that I was on. And the, the journey with Islam was approximately two years mm -hmm. from when I first started to explore the Quran. And the last year or so, I was going to the Juma services on Friday regularly and church services on Sunday regularly. So you're going to the mosque and the church? And the church. You're going to both at the I same time? I was switch hitting at that time because yeah. I hadn't fully committed myself to the decision. It felt inevitable. It, uh, without doubt, it felt inevitable. And people would ask me at the masjid all the time, when are you going to take Shahada? When are you going to take Shahada? And I would tell them, I said, my family is very religious. I said, I need to be sure that this, I'm not going to just jump the broom and yeah. jump right You're back. You're really doing your homework. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, thing, the thing that sold me on the deen was the deen itself was the deen itself. I was reading the Quran the entire time. I was listening to Juma khutbahs, you know, weekly. You know, I was, you know, continue, I would, don't remember, but I'm sure I was probably reading some other stuff as well and having conversations with people in the, in the community, etc. And so it was the deen itself that sold me. There was no personality, no individual involved in my journey. This was a very personal journey for me. And so that, that nature of how I journeyed to the religion of Islam informs how I out, do outreach to others. I trust in the fact that Allah will guide their hearts. I try to be a resource. I try to be uh, a support. Yeah. But I don't f pretend to have the ability to make them any particular way. My job is to just provide them the, f the facts, the truth, and to help open their eyes the way my eyes were opened mm -hmm. and trust that if Allah wants good for this person, they will be guided. And if I can be a small part of that, then alhamdulillah. And alhamdulillah, especially in this position here with the Islamic Center of Irving in, in the outreach department, um, I've been very fortunate to have many people come through here and, and want to take their shahada. Mm -hmm. um, and like one of my dear, my dear teachers, Kareem Abu Zaid, uh, may Allah protect him. Um, um, he mentioned in one of his televised uh, shahadas, he said, we don't necessarily have anything to do with this. We're just here at the end. He, he made it very clear that people sometimes, they associate the fact that someone takes shahada on your hand, that somehow that's, that's something that elevates you or dignifies you. It's like, this is no dignity. This is, they're dignifying me by allowing me to do that. They're, they're the ones honoring me. They, I'm not honoring them. I'm not earning honor for myself. There's nothing. I'm nothing in this. Anyone could have stepped in and done what I, did, what I did. It doesn't require me. So that Allah brings them to me is an honor for me. It's not, an, it's, it's not something that, that makes me special. It's I'm being gifted. I'm the one being blessed by that. I'm the one, the, the one that's poor, the one that's weak, that's, that's being given. I'm the lower hand. Allah's is the upper hand, and he's bringing them to me. It's not me doing anything to bring them. Uh, what, what do you have to say for the people who might be atheist, agnostic, even though I, I, I personally don't believe there's such thing as a true atheist. Right. You know, I believe everybody... There's a lot of people that say that, yeah. Yeah, I, I believe everyone deep down <clears throat> inside, they believe in a higher power, but because they were exposed to many of these man-made religions, right. And then they go ahead and just reject that, but they haven't really explored Islam. And if they're sincere, they'll come to it like you right, did. Right. And you took it to a whole nother level. You started studying and really, really growing in knowledge and you became an imam. And now tell me, what do you say for the agnostic, the atheist, the Christian, others who are, you know, maybe leaving the church or they're just leaving religion right, altogether right. and they're exploring and then they fall into the pits of uh, that dark hole of just following your desires. They're not happy there. Right. Now they're listening. They're tuning in. You know, wh what is it uh, that separates Islam from all the man-made religions? How do we know it's not man-made? What are the proofs that you like to point people to in their beginning stages? Right. There's, there's so much in that. And, and to be honest with you, one of the greatest um, tools to opening people's eyes just to faith in general was something I, I learned from one of your episodes when you were interviewing I can't remember the the brother's name may Allah reward him but he mm -hmm. was you were doing a drive by a drive along interview with him in in the car and he was mentioning atheism and a book he had read recently mm -hmm. by Anthony Flew mm -hmm. Anthony Flew 
He was, was like the prophet of atheists. The pre yeah, he was the preeminent atheist for 50 years yeah. in, the, in the West. Was the one at the pinnacle of academic achievement and argumentation in, the fa in favor of the belief that there is no God at all. And make no mistake, it is a belief, which in and of itself is a linguistic irony, but that's a whole other topic. Um, but I would challenge anyone that believes that they're agnostic, atheist, or whatever, to read his book, a book where he tells his journey, journey of going from being a staunch atheist to becoming a believer in the divine and what he discovers. And just as a, as a summary or as a, as a nutshell of one of the major points that he makes, the major point that he makes, because people will talk about the, the idea of chance or just that things come about by chance or whatever. And while the, the way he puts it, I'm paraphrasing, you might be able to explain chance ev evolution of a single book or, or, you know, a single hand or a single creature. Maybe, maybe. It's, even that's somewhat far-fetched and there's lots of classical examples in Islam and other, and other f faith traditions to answer that supposition. But what he points out is that while you might be able to make a case for a single entity, a single, a single item, the ability to explain the network of systems that exist in creation, the interplay and the interworkings of all the different creations and how they operate together, that is something that mere chance can never, ever possibly explain. And that was one of the most damning evidences to him of the falsity of the atheist proposition. The example I often use, and some of you may or may not be familiar with this, is mycelium. Mycelium is a fungus that grows on the roots of trees. What they discovered many years ago, actually now, was that this fungus and the network it creates between trees of different types and varieties over large swaths of land in a forest, they form a network, almost like a neural network between the trees, thinking and reacting and responding to rises and falls and moisture and temperature and things like that and resource redistribution. It's a very complicated, integrated network between multiple different organisms. And so something like that, the idea of chance, the idea of there being no designer, no, no manager, no creator, no planner, is completely unable to answer or explain. This is a miracle of itself, just right there. By itself alone. This is a miracle, and it's called the what? Mycelium. Mycelium. And this is a fung... A fungus that fungus. attaches to the roots of trees that creates the, a network this between is a, them. The, the miracle of fungus now, this mycelium. Yes. Wow. And this convinced uh, him... It, that wasn't his uh, example necessarily, his but when I read that, that yeah. was the one that well, came, to, came to my to mind. mind. Because there was many stories going around in the years preceding that about this mycelial network and the discoveries they had made and all of the yeah. things they had found about how it operates. If you think just, and, and people who, who know me well, they know that I make very nerdy references frequently. If you've seen the original Avatar, not the new one, the original Avatar, and they talk about how the, the tree, the mother tree, is, has a network throughout the, the, the soil. This network, the way they describe it in Avatar, is similar in, in a sense to this mycelial network where it, it ha it's almost thinking, it's almost alive in and of itself, and it processes the memories, etc. But in, in, in a different way, in, in the real life, it's not as superstitious and, and fantastical, of course, but it's still no less miraculous. Wow, this is truly amazing. The miracle is right in front of us, just ourselves, you know, if you dissect, you know different components yeah. in your body and everything. I actually, the, the, the khutbah I gave just the other day um, was on al-Fatiha. Mm -hmm. And I like to revisit al-Fatiha with people frequently because it's such a crucial element to our lives as Muslims. But we frequently, we don't reflect on it. And I was talking about just the first verse, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, all thanks and praises due to Allah, the creator and the sustainer of all the worlds. And it was talking about this idea of hamd, praise, and how it in contains not just praise for the perfect attributes of Allah, the perfect attributes of God, but also shukr or gratitude for all that he gives us. And how if we even just reflect on something we're doing right now, 
that we aren't even thinking about. Our heart is beating. We're breathing in. We're breathing out. Even just one of those things, if we were to take a moment to recognize it and show gratitude for it by saying, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, we then would be trapped in a never-ending cycle of thanks and praise for that one thing. And that's far from the totality of the blessings and the mercies that we're experiencing in this very moment. It's a never-ending cycle of gratitude, even for the most basic thing that we do. You just named a couple of things, just uh, the heart beating, the yes. breath air you're taking in, you know. And just, not even just the fact that we breathe, but the breath, the breath we take right now, that one breath. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. And because we've said that, the Prophet even in some ahadith, he says that the thing that you've been given when you say Alhamdulillah, and I'm paraphrasing, just so that we're clear, I'm paraphrasing, the, when you respond with Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, for something you've been given, what you say is better than what you were given. What you say is better than what you've been given. given. Wow. No matter what it is, what you say, when you say Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, for having received it, is better than the gift. Even if you were, according to one narration, even if you were given the totality of the heavens and the earth, if you said in response, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, it would be better than what you were just given. And that's praising the creator of the heavens and the earth. Like Christian would say, Hallelujah. Yes. Similar? Yes. <laughs> wow. This is uh, truly amazing. And it reminds me of another, before we conclude, just came to me the hadith where the Prophet Muhammad, last final message, sent to mankind, peace and blessings be upon him. He said, you know, you'd have to pray all day. Imagine all day and night you would have to pray just to thank Allah, the Creator, for the 360 joints in your body. Right. But He allows you just... Every day. Every yes. day, right? Every day. But you can do that by just substituting with two yep. extra units of prayer, mm -hmm. right, to show your thankfulness and gratefulness. And that's... We can go on and on all yeah, day. Yeah. And we'd be here sitting here just, yeah. you know... Absolutely. You could, no, there's, there's, there's so... The, this I, is the thing. Islam... Frequently I get asked questions about Islam and they ask me about the answer. I said, I, I give them the answer and frequently the answer seems almost too simplistic sometimes. Yeah. And I tell them, I said, it's that simple, but it's also that hard. Mm -hmm. Because many times the answer is very simple. It, it, it doesn't require a lot of mental gymnastics. It's designed to be something that every rational human being can understand and accept. But it's so, it's so magnificent because even though seemingly simple, the depths of its ocean are so deep that scholars spend lifetimes just trying to understand mm -hmm. that one thing. The example I gave in the khutbah I was referring to earlier, al-Fatiha. We recite it 17 times a day at a minimum in our salawat, in our prayers, our formal prayers. Understanding it is so critical to our life as a Muslim. Books have been written on Al-Fatiha, explaining Al-Fatiha from the scholars of the past, numbering, at least the translations, numbering in the hundreds of pages in explaining seven lines, wow. seven sentences. One of our dear brothers in uh, California, Sheikh Jamal ad-Din mm -hmm. may Allah preserve him, Amen. He did a lecture series on Al-Fatiha in which he started off by apologizing for only scratching the surface wow. after then lecturing for 30 hours on Al-Fatiha. And he had to apologize at the start for only scratching the surface. His name, again, for people who... Jamal ad Zarabozo. And interesting enough, just like yourself, just like Dr. Gerald Dirks, he also comes from a background, a Christian background. He was Absolutely. also someone yes. who converted, reverted to Islam. Yes, he's one of the he's one of the the elders of the of the convert community in the United States, having converted in I believe it was like seventy two. Yes. In a very small community in California, where he was very much by himself. He and I have had the opportunity to sit and talk from time to time, and he was one of my very early teachers. Um, and he's he is perhaps one of the most humble people you will ever meet, but his knowledge is well recognized by people all over the world. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's, in closing now, uh, amazing story. We can even go deeper. Uh, but uh, for the person that's out there, 
you know, and I think that's what's kind of just shakes people like the simplicity and they're like because they're used to all this esoteric stuff this uh, mystical these Absolutely. mystical strange things and whatnot yeah. and you hear here it comes with that beginning step you know what's the purpose of life why am i here why have i been created why not ask the creator of the heavens and earth the one who created you to guide me i mean mm. how important is that you know to ask those questions of purpose why i've been created and then asking the creator alone to gu for guidance Yes, absolutely, absolutely. We believe, and even you can find in the Quran evidence for this, we believe that if someone genuinely and sincerely from the bottom of their heart is seeking God, is seeking Allah, that they will be guided to it. So much so that if you look into the Quran, you'll find places where Allah challenges the Jews and the Christians to follow their book, to adhere to their book, because Allah knows and the Muslims understand that there was real and true guidance in their books. Allah even says that, that in those books there was nur and huda, light and guidance in those books. They've been changed throughout history and time for various reasons. This is what we believe but the final revelation, the revelation that we rely upon that exists till this day in its pristine form as it was revealed over 1400 years ago, tells us that if we seek him, he will bring us guidance. If we respond to him when he calls, he will give us guidance. So if you're out there, if you've felt that gnawing inside of you that we all feel from time to time and you know somewhere deep inside you that there's an answer that there's a path forward for you pray to the creator of the heavens and the earth and ask him to lead you to the straight path and we believe with the firmest of convictions that if you do and you are sincere whether in this life or the next, you will be counted amongst the guided. And we will welcome you in paradise as brothers and sisters. Inshallah, Allah willing. Thank you, Imam Sayyid. Thank you very much. Jazakallah Thank Jazakallah you for sharing yaakum. this story with us. I cannot leave without giving you a gift. If you're not yet Muslim and you tune in to see what these Muslims are talking about and you like a free copy of the Quran, go ahead and visit thedeanshow.com. We'll take care of the postage and everything and get it delivered to you. And if you still have some questions about Islam, call us at 1-800-662-4752. We'll see you next time. Until then, peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. And if you like this episode of The Dean Show, like this video, share this video far and wide, and support us on our Patreon page so we can continue this work. Thank you for tuning in. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum.